Welcome to Commotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. I'm Yuli Rivera, Commotion Labs Life Sciences Senior Manager. Fundamentals for Startups is our regular lecture series open to anyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship or building a startup. Each week, we feature experts from various fields who bring you insights and inspiration and give you the opportunity to ask questions. All sessions are recorded and archived on Commotion's website. Okay, <laughs> Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator program hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the UW community. We're committed to nurturing and enabling startup success through critical infrastructure, training, mentoring, and networking. And we do this without taking equity or IP. We operate out of three locations on campus, each with its own industry focus. The life sciences and hardware incubators are both located in Fluke Hall and our technology incubator, which is based in Startup Hall. If you're a founder looking for somewhere to thrive, we'd love to talk to you. Today, Don Shu is here to present Compose Your Slide Deck for Success. Don is a general partner, partner at Apertu Capital, which invests in deep tech and software startups that are seed, at seed to series B stages of fundraising. Don created one of the world's largest open source communities with 10,000 members and founded the Python community's most financially successful grassroots conference. We'll take questions via the YouTube chat and in person at our live event at the end of Don's talk. I will now turn over the event to Don. Thank you, Yui. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. First, thank yous to Uli, I wouldn't be here without him. Uh, and then Ash, Ashley Esteban and Caroline for also having me here. And anybody in Seattle area, you should get to know Sarah Studer at Techstars if you want to be friends with people anyways. But um, how many people here are Huskies, by the way? Good. Want to scream out something, a greeting for everybody? Go Huskies or anything? Go dogs. Go dogs, Go yeah. I'll start out with a surprising uh, similarity or coincidence between my alma mater, Columbia University, and University of Washington. Both schools are Rose Bowl winners. You can look it up. I'm not lying at all. <laughs> so Aperture Capital is a new fund. We started um, as of June. That's when we closed our first fund. Um, the fund itself is small, but with the backing of a very important partner, we're planning on deploying $100 million of capital over the next two years. Um, and we predominantly like to be at the pre-seed to seed stage. I've worked with some founders who are maybe going to commence next month, for example, and I've been speaking to them for 18 months. Um, my partner in the fund is Enrico marini Fichera. Um, he comes from a very strong finance background. Um, previously, prior to us commencing on this fund, he ran a, an $8 billion um, single family office. Um, he was part of uh, one of the biggest acquisition kind of run ups in PE and kind of finance history. So we're an unusual combination where I'm coming from the standpoint of the technologists and he's got really strong finance background that is rare and we've developed this slide deck together hopefully to help founders and it's really a result of what I've been really watching how he reacts to how founders present and it's a very specific way and the way I think about for you as founders for reaching your financial stakeholders is that you need to create a, a common reality and I'm going to take a drink here. <laughs> and what I mean by that is when you're starting as a founder, you're kind of in this dark tunnel. There's no light, but you're responsible for creating that light and aligning those people that you want to invest to see that light the way that you do. And that's going to be the basis of what I'm going to present. So one of the things that are, is fascinating for me and has been a big growth journey is working with Enrico and understanding truly 
how financial professionals digest the kind of materials I've produced in the past, try to raise for startups and help founders. And it's very different from really what I had anticipated actually. Okay. And part of this really, I think where you want to really begin is understanding who you're trying to sell to. And this is really going to apply more for the context of professional investors as opposed to individual angels. Individual angels that you meet are often, you know, they just want to be fans very often of a founder and they have a very much of a journey that's more similar to founders. Professional investors don't necessarily fit that kind of a track record or history. So a professional investment group typically has a number of personas involved in qualifying your deal. So I would really recommend founders to understand which each step of your deal getting qualified means, all right, for each person involved and what their motivations are, all right? At the very first step where your deal gets introduced to a firm, it's probably somebody who's fairly new in their career. They're typically going to come more from a finance background and they're trying to understand your language because that person, your first kind of point of contact to qualify your deal is going to be responsible for digesting your materials and preparing that for review for the folks who will make the actual commitment of investing in your company. So the easier you can make it for that person to understand your story, the faster your deal can progress. Because if you have a lot of idiosyncratic jargon, nomenclature that's very specific to your domain, that person is going to have to struggle to translate that for these financial professionals that don't live in your world or reality, and it's just gonna slow it down or you just never get considered. And nobody's gonna be rude to you. They're just gonna tell you they're too busy or that you're not a fit, or maybe they misunderstood what you're really about and you're a perfect fit and you will not progress any further in that consideration. So some of the things that people are gonna really consider at the very beginning is how you even got to be considered. And that is the very important stage of every founder when they commence in their journey is you really need to develop your network. And these have to be fairly close relationships, something that's meaningful. It can't be something where you just met somebody and they maybe remember your name. You really have to take it to the level where they will remember you. And YC, if you go through YC, for example, those founders get coached that during the entire time they're going through YC, that they are going to be out identifying likely future investors. A program I had run for the Python Software Foundation, um, I spoke with one of my founders in my program, was YC, I think 2015 or 2016, this person had an article in a pretty good publication claiming that they had raised 2.8 million from strangers in two days. The reality was, he told me, he spent the entire time while he was going through the program meeting every week with potential investors so that by the time he got to demo day, he had a demand and that is when he closed those people. Though the, the story claims it happened in two days, this was actually a process that was pre-qualified, okay, where they ran through the whole exercise of identifying potential funders and priming them ready for an event. And you really have to take control of that tempo. So how will your deal progress? Right. Let's say your materials are taken in, it's digested, it's committed to a form within that firm 
of how they share the deal, then it will go to some form of a discussion. Professional firms will have investment committees. Everything has to get committed and documented. For our firm, even though it's two people, we actually have investment committee meetings of the two of us, just staring at each other maybe. Well, we're over Zoom. Um, and we commit all of that to a document and it's committed to a folder, it's committed to a memory, and every deal that we make will have a track record of where it was committed to some form of written material. That's us, and we are not that idiosyncratic from other firms, so just keep that in mind. Understand how the firm operates, how they're staffed, there's varying degrees of size of firms, and that'll determine kind of how institutional they are, so keep that in mind. So motivations, a new financial professional in a firm, what is their motivation? Just think about that. What they want to do is prove themselves, source good deals, get a reputation so that they can move on to the next level, get the next job title. Okay, you're going to have mid-level folks in an investment firm who aren't general partners. They'll be more involved in investment decisions. What are they wanting to do? If they're ambitious, they're going to want to develop their track record. They're going to want to interface with potential funders for their future fund. And they're all going to be looking at you from their own standpoints of what they gain. Okay. And the general partners, they're under a lot of pressure to show returns. And if you look at venture capital as a category on the average, it's not a good asset category. All right. Most of the folks that you're going to interact with are probably struggling. Strange thing, right? They get all this money, and your average VC firm is going to underperform the S&P. On the... Yeah, please. If you're a first-time founder, yeah, sure. Um, again, oh, so. Basically, should a founder change their approach based on whether? Yeah. Sorry, is this working? Yeah. So, you just mentioned that like not there's a, probably the majority of firms firms you talk with are actually not successful, and so as a founder, you know, we kind of like look at them all the same. You know, some are bigger, some are smaller, but I've never thought about looking at them as like, oh, this firm has probably got mo many more, like they're struggling to return their money to their LPs versus other firms who are just doing it, you know, very easily. And should you change your pitch based on whether you think, you know, you're talking to one kind of firm or another? So um, not to toot our own horn, we're a brand new fund. We closed our first fund in June of this past year. An exception in venture is new firms tend to outperform. And so for also for new founders, if you can identify those new form, uh, firms, they're probably more motivated um, to get into deals. Uh, typically with founders, most founders are looking for the brand names and struggling to try to get into the same firms everybody else is, where really as a new founder, you're better off looking for the newer managers. They're just going to be more motivated to get in return because for me and my partner, we can't raise our second fund until we show a track record. 
It took us two years to get to the point where we closed our first fund. All right. So the other thing where you say about do you change your approach depending on the firm and their performance, I don't think that matters so much. And that's kind of the point of this is all the financial kind of professionals are going to examine your deal kind of in the same way. Um, that those funds are underperforming, it's not so much that um, it's not so much in terms of how they necessarily qualify the deal. You know, it's in terms of the research. I haven't seen anything that really breaks down why most firms struggle as a category. Myself, it's worth taking a look at. Um, there are folks who definitely study venture, you know, but um, you know, the top firms that do really well are probably actually not the firms you read in the papers. Some of the most famous funds, if you really actually look on their returns, is you'll discover that they're marketing machines that they're very good at getting your attention. But if you actually look at the returns, they're okay, but they're not category B. So, but on the point of when a f investor says something to you and what does that mean, I'd like to make that a little more interactive and I don't know if we can do that with the online folks, but I'll take a drink if they wanna throw out any kind of anecdotes for me to interpret. Who's fundraising right now? How many investor conversations have you had? One, early. One? One also? What's your prospect list look like of investors you're trying to reach? How many are on that list? Guess at a number, 30. You probably need more. I emailed 6,000 investors in a very certain category with affinity that were identified as likely to be qualified uh, investors with interest to get two LPs. I don't ask founders to do anything I haven't done or wouldn't do. How big is your list? We're at about, yeah, we're, we're a little less, about 25. Need more? Yeah. So you haven't gotten to a conclusion with the one conversations you both started? Oh yeah, we literally started this week. Started this week. Anybody else raised before? How many conversations did you have when you raised before? Yeah. Um, for one, it was one phone call. Um, for others, it was many. It could be, you know, 50 conversations. So you closed out successfully with one phone call? But it was because of my partner. What was your partner's characteristic? Uh, he had um, known uh, tech and uh, pre previous experience. So they were more investing in our team and the idea. So, so. your co-founder is a leader in the Node community? Yes. Okay, Not for this current company, for, but for that company. So that's another thing. If, if you have a certain kind of characteristic, it can work. But maybe you can share some of those other conversations, though, of what investors said and if you wanted an interpretation, or at least my version. Um, uh, of course, we did a lot of the regular routines, Alliance of Angels, Koretsu, all these um, local ones, but a lot of individual conversations with uh, VC firms, attorneys, others, uh, individual angels. Did you have any conversations that you found confusing or? 
you're spot on with what you're saying. Know their motivations. Know exactly how you need to speak clearly without jargon. These things, it's, it's I'm just getting refresher here because it's been a few years, it's been three, four years for me. Well, we can make this interactive. So um, just to identify, we're at CoMotion. It's a known entity, institution, and platform that's very respected in the region. We have Sarah here from Techstars Seattle. It's, I think, maybe the second branch of Techstars after the Colorado group, and one of the most successful as well. But also, what's your name? I'm sorry. Um, Wayne. Wayne. And Wayne brought up Alliance of Angels. is probably one of the oldest and largest angel investment groups in Seattle. They have a monthly uh, lunch, I think, at the Seattle Tennis Club. The Seattle Tennis Club has, I think, a 10-year... Has... Am I broken? <laughs> the Seattle Tennis Club club has a 10-year wait list for membership. Um, just to give you an idea what kind of an institution that is in Seattle of, you know, interpret as you will. Um, and promising founders get invited to luncheon, at which point the members will make a decision about investing. Kiritsu is, I think, kind of a family office club. Um, and then I think there's a few other groups, but those are probably the two most uh, recognizable kind of angel investment groups that you'll find in Seattle. So, but yeah, I have a big list of uh, potential prospects. Um, Wayne, maybe you could share some good signals you had before. Of course, one phone call and done, that's a great signal. But um, what kind of signals of interest have you interpreted in the past that turned out promising? Um, an investor is, is truly interested. They're following up with you pretty actively. Yeah. Um, they want to connect with you and they want to hear more. They're happy to follow up afterwards. at the time so. So that's, I mean we can address that against the macroeconomics here in a little bit but a lot of activity so an example is we're taking a look at an AWS alum uh, talked about it a little bit with Connor in our audience here who's here as a representative of uh, kind of a sovereign fund from um, Ireland and I sent him a bullet point list of questions of 20 questions yesterday so if you get something like that these people are very busy and if they took a lot of time to go through your materials to give you that many questions that's an indication of interest the more work you're doing for a professional investor the better it is okay um, there's these stories, again, I'll go back to the YC founder where the story is raised from strangers $2.8 million in two days. Those kind of stories are very titillating, but as I shared with you, that story wasn't even true. It makes for great press, but the real process of investing is more like the founders I've been speaking with for 18 months and getting to know them, understand them, and plus understand for particularly outstanding talent is, will they actually keep to it? Because you have the very strange phenomenon in venture where you have people who could potentially just walk into million dollar a year jobs begging for $100,000, $50,000, maybe even $10,000 checks. So I have to understand that this person that I think is extremely talented 
will they actually keep to it? Will they have a sense of fiduciary obligation to people who have invested their capital? Because legally, there's a contract, but those kind of investment agreements, they're not indentured servitude. It really comes down to an investor understanding and interpreting the character of you as a founder and whether or not you really care about what you're pitching. Enrico insisted, meet in person if possible. Um, very recently, we had a founder where it would have been really hard to consider them if I hadn't met them in person. And the deal from all kind of characteristics otherwise looked great. Um, just didn't understand the founder that well until meeting them in person. So just keep that in mind. So we'll actually get into the outline and it's fairly straightforward, but I can just kind of give you my interpretations and what I'm looking for. In terms of the mission, I just really want to understand that that's clearly articulated. And what's very important for our team is even if I understand the tech, that founder really needs to make that really clear that my finance professional partner understands it. And if he has to interpret it, or if he needs my explanation, we may never have the time for me to make that explanation. Or my explanation, if you're relying on my explanation, I may get it completely wrong. So you, you gotta make sure that that's understandable by somebody who has no basis in your domain of knowledge. Because they'll just get frustrated. I had a pitch with a very sharp ML expert. They kept mentioning tools, companies, processes without providing any context and I was getting lost. Okay. Thankfully, Enrico wasn't on that call because that kind of a presentation would have confused him to the point where he would have asked me what, what does it make sense to meet again with that founder? I can't understand anything that person is saying. In our own decision framework of qualifying a deal, one of the points that we want to understand is a founder's ability to explain themselves because it's not just about building that business also we as early stage investors, we have to understand if that founder can go on and explain it to another investor who's even more institutional than us and even further away from the tech. So you really gotta prove that point. In your language, make it so simple. I've struggled with my decks where I try to come up with novel language without comprehending like I do now, that that's just confusing for somebody like Enrico. And my kind of motivation to show off how smart I am, I was just shooting myself in the foot. They want really simple, direct English. And amazingly, this one is missing probably from probably about 40% of our presentations we review, your actual business plan. People will have these great ideas, they'll have this kind of a thesis about where we're headed as humanity, and then really fail how they're gonna get paid for it. These finance professionals wanna intimately understand how you're gonna price it, what does that product look like? You want to get it as close to like looking like soap on a grocery store aisle. Just think about it. 
look at a product on an average grocery store shelf and what it says to you and how clearly it's communicated because they work very hard on that so they you'll buy it incumbents the thing is sometimes founders feel like saying that they're completely unique there's, there's nothing else like it finance from a standpoint is trying to compare comparables that's how you try to understand how to price something that's how you understand what your outcomes will likely look like they want to look at companies in that space and what financial success they achieved so you really want it to contextualize right really who's real in that why you're going to take over okay there's certain things where you know it's kind of obvious you have these legacy tech companies that people don't take particularly seriously and those are easy cases to make you know large organizations right inherently one of our investments that we made includes a C level from Microsoft as one of its biggest angel investors this person is works a lot with um, early stage founders and their coaching to the founders they work with is don't be afraid of the big ones you, you just gotta out innovate them and you have the right environment these bigger companies there's very specific kind of cultural structural and organizational issues as to why they fail and they can't address what a startup can okay and then you kind of recently have this big example of meta where you had the founder trying to turn them into a startup again tried to sell this huge vision of the metaverse and they got punished and the minute they started talking more like a big organization yesterday I think it was 20 percent jump in their stock price and value that is such a app description of your opportunity as a startup founder but it also crystallizes how you have to pitch your investors because those are the people you're you're investing in are the people who in, who rewarded meta for acting like an established company it's quite a tension it's not easy I always have a huge amount of sympathy for founders going out because it is quite a conundrum and competitors also every time we're considering a deal when we get really serious we want a matrix we want you to understand how you stack up against competitors we understand that if it's a worthwhile opportunity that other people are examining it as well so just ignoring that and just saying that there's no competition that's kind of a non-starter for us it's going to be extremely rare that that's really actually true but mostly a lot of times making that claim will undermine your credibility with us at least when we're considering your opportunity and also the other thing is also for us we really look for the founder to give us a picture of what success looks like all right because we expect the founders to understand that better than we do and then it's our homework to verify it substantiate that and decide whether or not we believe that founders presentation we will very rarely tell a founder what we think their success looks like and team Wayne gave the example we invest in founders from the open source community we invested in Anaconda which is kind of the OS for ML and data science the co-founder of that company who's no longer active is kind of like the Linus Torvalds for data created an important uh, Python library that made it 
relevant, made that programming language relevant for data science. So the more you have the case that you have somebody like Linus Torvalds, for example, or the modern version of Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, that's proof you have some kind of tacit knowledge that's a big advantage, and investors look for that. For your universe, what you're attacking, you really want to make that clear if you have that advantage. Half the time, when a founder pitches us, I know what the question is coming if they don't bring it up. Enrico wants to understand, what's that deal really look like? I, I know for most folks in this room, including me, we're, I feel like we're just talking about paper and some text but for financial professionals, this is a very important qualifying characteristic as to whether or not they're interested. Some investors just will not invest in certain kind of securities. Some investors will only do a priced round with preferred um, shares. You, know, you just really gotta understand that. And you should be very explicit in determining what that investor's appetite is and what they're looking for. And we have had cases where founders have adjusted for our own preferences in terms of the type of documentation we want around that investment. Okay. Always, 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 every investor is gonna wanna understand what are your milestones, what are you gonna achieve with that capital, okay? Because what they really want to understand is, are you going to get more funding? No investor wants to be the last money, all right? They really want to understand that you understand how to get there. They also really want to understand that you know that, <laughs> all right? Because a lot of times, first time founders, they're not going to understand that kind of mentality because hopefully, you're not financial professionals and you're a lot more creative than the average financial professional because again, your materials, just understand that you're not talking to folks mostly who are in the business of being imaginative and creative. No, they want to invest in people who are, okay. Um, valuations. We've seen this recently with very promising teams where they are really essentially are on the wrong four weeks of raising. So one example is we're looking at a team from Big Co. They were part of these uh, very important open source projects. Colleagues from the same team about six months ago raised something like an $8 million pre-seed. No business, anything, just based on their reputations, like they ran some pretty important open source projects, they have a lot of credibility, they have a premise, they have some people who are giving them good validation. People from that same team, a few months later, they're already talking about giving up. And they were just on two months difference in terms of when they commenced fundraising. And the companies are very identical, okay? So valuations change really unexpectedly when they do change. Be ready for that. Um, we've seen a lot of founders really struggle with that reality. The ones who have adjusted, we've written checks for, okay? But don't print your valuations. If you throw out a huge valuation that the investor thinks is unrealistic, I'll speak to how I would react is, I'll be polite. I may say, you know, it's probably outside of our range, but those conversations also end. I'm not gonna go back and propose a valuation way out of the range of expectation of that founder because I don't want to create an acrimonious relationship where it comes across like I'm devaluing 
their work or them. Okay, I'll just wait. I'll tell them that we'll keep in touch. We like what they're doing and see if they come back after they've gotten market feedback from other investors. I'm not going to be the bearer of bad news on that one. I, I just don't have any motivation to do that, to risk my relationship with somebody that I don't know that well. We always look at who the investors are. How much have they committed? How much time are they spending? Are they really in it? Um, there's some famous angel investors from the open source community who have started big, important companies. They've invested a lot, and then that also becomes a joke is, well, they're invested in everything. So even though people recognize them, they're famous, they have capital, they have credibility, except that they're so active that they don't in terms of being an investor in a particular opportunity, All right? So the level of commitment, what they spend um, in terms of their time, attention, their help, we want to understand that with existing investors, what that looks like. Uh, the amount of capital, uh, money loves company. So few investors want to be the only investor. Few investors want to be the only people interested because their own anxiety is going to create second guessing as to whether or not it's actually a real opportunity and maybe they're wrong. Any professional investor, again, is going to constantly challenge their own assumptions of what they think is valuable uh, because the opposite of that is FTX. You know, Sequoia has been very public about what they did wrong there. Okay, so, and careers are going to end because of what happened there. These people will never work as investment professionals again. And every investment professional at a firm you talk to, that's always looming as an anxiety. Okay, so keep that in mind. They're never going to do you a favor because they're thinking about their own livelihood and what their responsibilities are financially and it's just not worth it for them to stake it for anybody. Leads, you know, for us, sometimes also, if we're not comfortable with setting a valuation because the valuation is out of expectation, we will offer to go on if somebody else sets that um, expectation. Again, we don't want to be the bearer of that bad news but we do like the opportunity, we like the founders, and we want to support them. Because if somebody else comes in that is a brand name, perhaps that de-risks the opportunity and that, that investor will be motivated to make sure that that company makes it to the next funding. And a model, professional investors, Professional investors get really frustrated if they don't see a model. And for me also, I'll agree with most founders, it's all made up, it's an intellectual exercise, but guess what? For financial professionals, that is how they learn their jobs. When they start out in nascent, early financial roles, they have to build those things. So for them, those are real and you need to treat it that way and understand whatever our interpretation of that is not as important as if you want your deal to move forward and always always be really clear about who's going to be the contact and keep that consistent the issue is if you have many points of contact and you're not consistent in how you're managing that relationship that can be incorrectly interpreted as disorganization at the most benign or dishonesty. Kind of the most negative interpretation. Meetings are pretty boring, right, generally? On average? People love meetings. 
Uh, when I worked with founders and coaching them on pitching and raising for their startups, I'd always explain to them that book the meetings because an investor's professional obligation is to book meetings. But also, most meetings on average are not entertaining. <laughs> They're pretty boring. Most people don't make a particular effort at monitoring their energy or trying to assess how their message is received or how they're influencing somebody. But a, a book I really like is Daniel Pink's To Sell as Human. And he talks about attitude as being very important, the energy, just how you engage with somebody. Think about it. And I think the book's a worthwhile read. Um, we talked about it with Wayne and I'm sorry. Dan. What? Dan. Dan um, is I believe in having a lot of leads. A lot of leads. Like I gave you the example, six thousand leads for two qualified LPs on that. And again, your investors particularly the professional ones, all they care about is, will they get a return? That's what their preoccupation is. So keep it going, keep it moving forward. If you're serious with an investor, be really frequent with it. Don't go dormant, keep them engaged and keep them surprised also. And the other thing also is, if they don't come around the first time, keep them updated. Um, I had a founder who probably missed out on $5 million of extra valuation just because they didn't keep me updated. I got alerted to them raising last minute. Um, we just didn't have enough history or interaction with them to really push that valuation. And that founder left a lot of money on the table because they didn't keep me updated. And really be concise in your language. I learned personally just interacting with Enrico to really keep focus even, even in our personal language. We've known each other since we were undergrad at Columbia and taking an art history course together. But even with him and our interaction, it's just not worth it for me to go to a field and talking about something because it becomes this complete digression of him reminding me of getting back on task. So be careful of how you speak with these folks. Folks in this category of business do not like being confused. Keep it clear. And the interactions keep it personal. A lot of financial folks may get a little uncomfortable with founders who thinking that they're building rapport by being overly friendly, you know, inviting them to family events or something like that when you don't know each other very well. Keep cognizant of that. And your investors, they're not your friends. The people you pitch, they're not your friends. The rare examples where you see investors and those founders who are real friends, they've probably been through that several cycles to build that trust. But that is the important thing also is this whole exercise that you're doing, your slide deck that you're presenting it's all about trying to reinforce or build, initiate trust with somebody because that's really what the investment decision comes down to is did you build enough trust? And follow up. I think 95% of all folks, including most founders, very poor in follow up. I gave you a concrete example personally where somebody left millions on the table because they did not follow up. Um, always be asking for feedback if they're a professional investor, if they are 
transparent. If they're the kind you want to work with, they should provide you some form of feedback. Um, push for a conclusion as well. Sometimes I think I've fallen into this as well when I've raised is leaving a, an investor alone, just thinking if they're interested, they'll get back to me or you know maybe at some point they'll change their mind. Getting them to a no is actually sometimes a win because then you can focus on the real possibilities, what are real prospects. Always have a backup plan. Fundraising is not easy. Most people never get there. Um, and increasingly, there's alternative avenues as well for fundraising. It's not always venture. A friend of mine, um, really smart person, lives in Silicon Valley, is very active with some open source communities I know pretty well. And they were doing this robotic deal that needed physical points of presence. I had actually advised them that maybe they don't need venture, that maybe it's more of a deal where they could require an incumbent legacy type company with physical presence. There's different investors for that, that will invest in companies that have balance sheets, that have financial performance and really take it over and then introduce the tech through that channel. Uh, that particular friend never listens to my advice, so never mind. And also, going back to none of these investors you're pitching or your friends is don't rely on anybody. They do not have a professional obligation to you. Their obligation is their fiduciary responsibility to their stakeholders, their investors to get a return. So do not expect any one particular person just because you have a lot of interaction with them that they're necessarily going to come through because they invested that time. They invested that time because they think maybe you're promising, but if they can't get to a conclusion, you know, they're, they're not going to come through. There's not going to be a kind of a Hail Mary kind of moment. But, you know, through all that, keep positive. But it, it is hard, it's fun. This is my way of participating in the future. I really wanna be at this part of my life, the one that helps those outstanding creative people who really have a vision, really achieve their dreams. So I'm, I'm very privileged to be in this position. It's not a lot of people who get the opportunity that I have, particularly with the partners that I have behind us. Uh, just coming out as a first time manager with no track record on my part, um, being able to deploy a hundred million dollars of capital over two years. It's a dream come true But I hope there's questions Yeah, you, you talked about the value of having just a lot of conversations and reaching out to a lot of people and like how do you keep all those to be quality like meaningful contacts and um, you know, I guess you can divide up your potential investors into like the best fit and some that are moderately good and some that are weak at, like at some point it's, you're just creating a lot of email and wasting people's time. Like at what point do you cut that off and say like, okay, these are the ones that are relevant? Yeah. Well, that's my point about pushing it to a conclusion. Get them to be explicit. Be a little pushy, you're gonna to have to, and they're used to it if they're professional investors. They're pushy when they wanna be in a deal. They get it, they're, they're part of that game. So the other thing also though is, um, how many people know Moneyball? The book and concept. And the thing about Moneyball is that Michael Lewis, he got a message from Richard Thaler, the, Nobel Prize winning economist on uh, behavioral economics, where Richard Thaler told him, your, your story is not about data. And he told them that it's really about Tversky and Kahneman. So Tversky got the MacArthur Genius Award. He was a professor at Stanford, um, the person behind um, evidence-based uh, medicine up in Toronto was one of his collaborators when they were at Stanford at the same time as Tversky was on campus there. 
Uh, Kahneman actually, as a psychologist, got a uh, economics Nobel Prize because their work is so fundamental and across many different disciplines. And their whole thing about Moneyball, and which Richard Thaler told uh, Michael Lewis, and it turned into a book about the story between Tversky and Kahneman, is it's really about human bias and how we're wired. We're uh, evolutionarily wired to fool ourselves when we're in um, evaluating new situations or new knowledge. So the way that we operate between Enrico and I is we have decision frameworks. And for qualifying your investors, I would recommend you create one. And it doesn't have to be particularly elaborate, but you have to come up with certain characteristics you're going to measure and score those. Who's real? There are a couple people online that are asking about where you found the 6,000 prospects. There are many ways to do that. Python is a good way to go. There's a, a project called Scrapey, a lot of data scientists will be uh, familiar with. But there's also a lot of low code, no code ways to go about it. But um, it is amazing. I, I ran a group of 10,000 Python engineers here in Seattle. And the number of professionals working in software that started their careers by either one book, um, Automate the Boring Stuff, with Python, where people working in jobs with a lot of Excel finish their jobs in three weeks that normally would have taken them a year, and then later they become software professionals because they start thinking, maybe my job's not that valuable if I can get it done in three weeks with a little coding knowledge. Um, but there's a lot. You know, scrape um, data. There's a lot of web data. There's, you can pay for it. Most of the paid lists. There's a number of like kind of uh, private investing or family office kind of clubs and organizations. Some of them are really legitimate, but those are hard to get into because those people who run those curate the participants and who they invite. Um, the ones that are a little more available where you can buy a list for like six or eight hundred dollars, I wouldn't recommend it. I've seen such lists, they're not useful. But you, you do have to think hard about how you get those lists. Miguel online asks, do you have any advice on how to set a valuation that is both attractive to investors but um, avoids unnecessary dilution, dilution? And how would you determine if a valuation is unrealistic? First off, set your valuation, um, well, set your expectations on dilution pretty realistically. Uh, some folks, particularly brand new founders, I think maybe emphasize that too much. Um, different people are better at uh, preventing dilution than others. I think Jeff Bezos, when Amazon went public, still held the majority of the shareholdings. That's pretty uncommon. I don't know how that happened. I don't know Jeff Bezos, anybody knows him, ask him that question. That's the one I've always wanted to ask him. Michael Dell at IPO for Dell had less than 1%, I believe, of Dell. Uh, all of his wealth from Dell really came, I believe, from stock option grants after they went public from the board. Um, Box founder, I remember when he went public, he didn't have a large stake. Um, he was diluted quite a bit. He took a lot of investment. so. You know, you can still dilute and find value if you perform. A lot of early stage founders maybe don't make it there when you go to IPO and at that stage, or, or Aaron Levy, the box founder, he's still in charge, which is probably less common. Um, so there's that. The valuation is pretty informal, but the data that drives that is, uh, is the conversations you really have. People kind of set into certain ranges. Um, and for us, we try to see it at the range. There's no way for us at the stage we invest in to be particularly uh, driven on a balance sheet result or your financial results. That's just not where we're at. I mean, that's for public markets and public equities. Yeah. Um, it was actually a Columbia professor who innovated on um, evaluating companies by the financial performance gram 
Um, that's where Warren Buffett learned the whole idea. And he's the innovator who created the PE ratio. So that, you know, that's, there's a lot more data for public markets, but we're not in that business and it's really customary within the uh, community. It's, it's a pretty small community too. Yeah, I'd like to return to the um, 6,000 leads. Um, how did you manage that number of leads? Did you have like a lead management system? And did you send out query letters to all 6,000 uh, simultaneously? And, or did you do them in batches? Did you do them by priority or something? Yeah, that one, just being really transparent, I come from the open source community and you know, try to be very honest about everything is, um, didn't really expect much of a response. And the number of uh, meetings I actually booked out of that, which was probably about 20 out of that list to get to the two investors. Um, that was kind of my expectation. So we didn't put a lot into tracking it. And it was a mail merge strictly within Gmail. So that was just me Googling mail merge Gmail. And I didn't want to pay for Streak, which I've used in the past, Streak CRM, which is a Gmail extension, um, just because I didn't expect it worth the investment of even paying for that. But you should, yeah, you should use something. Um, I like Streak just because it's fast to get going. And how many people have used Streak or know about Streak? I got to know about Streak actually from the founder who was part of that story that they raised 2.8 or $3 million in two days from strangers. And during that batch of YC, I think Streak was part of that YC class and all the founders were using Streak. And at that point, running the program that I did for the Python Software Foundation, on an annual basis, I do cold outreach to like 400 founders, which because that was a very targeted population and I had the weight and brand of the foundation behind me, I'd get something like 70% response on my cold outreach, which was incredibly high. But um, that, again, is, you know, speaks to how you build your list. If it's extremely targeted, I mean, it's going to be a lot more effective, of course. But that's stating the obvious. Great. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for everyone in person that joined us, and thank you for everyone online that joined us. And thank you to Don for thank sharing some of my stories. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Great, Don. <laughs> Thanks, Don. 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 Thanks